Hello everyone and welcome to this. This is our second module uh, lecture and we're talking about revolution and constitution this week. I think this is probably one of the most interesting topics that we will cover this semester. They're all interesting topics, of course, but I think what's really unique about this topic is how it takes us back to a point in time to ask some questions about um, some facts about American uh, political history uh, that often don't get really considered or thought about. There's a common sense stance on a lot of these issues and I think a lot of people have problems with them and I would agree that uh, sometimes we uh, have a tendency to read very heavily into um, well perhaps not heavily enough actually we have a tendency to read uh, on, on the surface uh, uh, the, the sort of common sense understandings that are circulated to us from the media and other sources about what happened at the time of the consideration of the Constitution, who the founders were, the kind of values that they brought. And I think it's too clean cut. Um, actually, the founding of the United States of America, from a political theory perspective, was much more murky and muddled and messy than uh, the common sense version, I think, gives us much uh, appreciation for. Uh, the founders were certainly not some kind of monolithic group who all viewed the world the same way and had the same problems and the same priorities in um, establishing the Constitution and establishing the United States of America. They had different uh, perspectives and the debates around the Constitution really do, uh, I think, reflect those different perspectives. So the founders specifically disagreed about, and the book I think is good on this, six basic political issues. The nature of man. Um, was man inherently good or evil or somewhere in the middle? Um, the scale or the breadth, if you will, of political life. You know, how how big, how wide scaled should government be? Should, um, should it be more like the way the Greek, ancient Greek city-states were set up? You know, very small city-states with a certain amount of people within which uh, something more like a direct democracy could take place? Or should they be wide-scaled in order to, as uh, people like Madison would have argued, prevent the emergence of factions, you know, little groups that would uh, try to dominate and take over um, in small states, that taking over of a faction would be possible. Um, speaking of which, the uh, other question, uh, the third question, I guess the third basic political issue um, that the founders disagreed on was the extent to which, in fact, people should be represented at all. Um, to what extent should democracy be allowed? To what extent should democracy be, um, you know, taken seriously? To what extent should the United States be democratic? Uh, nobody really had agreement on this. There were different perspectives on that. Um, and consequently, of course, if you had faith in the people, then you would want the people to have the most power. If you were nervous about the people, then um, and, and nervous about human nature, then you would want to have some sort of separation of the powers. You'd want to have what they call checks and balances. Um, uh, conversely, if you had if you had great faith in the people, you'd want to have checks and balances that present prevent the emergence of. The kind of government that had um, basically led to the problems that the uh, early settlers were facing vis-a-vis -vis the presence of the British government and the will of the British government and empire in the daily lives of the people. So uh, that is going to be a factor there, uh, checks and balances either way if you will. And then we have questions about the nature of politics and the purpose of government itself. You know, is it to reflect the will of the people or is it to shape the will of the people? Um, people like Jefferson argued that it should kind of be a bit of both and that there should be a generous amount of space in there for the people to evolve and perfect themselves. Whether as Madison, as we will learn, um, being the federalist that he was, believed that the purpose of government was more to shape and mold the will of the people. Um, you know, these are debates that play out in the Constitution, but they're also debates that play out later in political life as well. Um, if we look at, for example, Lenin, a communist, 
um, he believed that the purpose of government was to shape the will of the people. Go back in time to Machiavelli, he believed that the purpose of government was to shape the will of the people. So, you know, these are not debates that were new, especially, and they were not debates that would go away. But uh, in this course, in this module, we'll be looking specifically at the debates in and around the founding of the United States. And of course, then finally, the question they disagreed on was the extent to which uh, the organization of political life itself should be uh, subject to change. To what extent should it be uh, modifiable over time? So um, this is just an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the so-called spirit of 76, that is the different ideas that were circulating in the build-up to the War of Independence and the Revolution. Um, we'll talk about the time that passed from the Revolution itself to the Constitution. Then we're talking about the Constitutional Convention, where a lot of these debates came to a head. We'll talk about the ratification of the Constitution and its significance uh, for Americans today in terms of the debate about American democracy and whether or not the will of the people should be or is in fact admitted into American political life. This is a debate that's going to haunt us and follow us for the rest of the semester actually. We'll talk a little bit about the Bill of Rights as a compromise that came to those who favored uh, democratic rights um, after the ratification of the Constitution and then conclusions in terms of debating democracy today. So um, I guess uh, from the perspective of those who are living in um, what became the United States, the landmass of North America, um, we uh, will later on in the semester have more to say about Native American or Indian affairs, but uh, just to sort of focus on the Europeans for the moment, um, where were they coming from? They were coming from Europe for the greater part. In fact, many of them were refugees of religious persecution. They were also men of letters in many instances, and they were aware that uh, there was a sort of a philosophical spirit of their times, right? They were people who were interested in um, questions of autonomy. Um, the fact that they were subject to religious persecution meant and implied that they had uh, specific views on um, how uh, they should have their relationship to government. And they valued principally self-government. And you can imagine why, because Obviously, the powers that be in Europe had persecuted their religious beliefs and um, they were fleeing Europe uh, in many instances to get away from that. They were not all religious um, uh, persecuted, or, or refugees rather, but many of them were. Um, and we see that, of course, reflected in the attitudes uh, latent in the Mayflower Compact of the 17th century. Um, the compact uh, established a very radical set of ideas uh, founded in the idea of a con the consent of the governed, okay? That government required the will of the people to be on board with it or it was not legitimate. So I think another thing that's often said and people like Tocqueville, who we'll talk a lot about later in the semester, uh, a French scholar, an analyst who traveled in the United States, um, you know, uh, what he observed was how there were lots of local civic organizations uh, active in the United States, um, in the colonies, and that these were people who, because generally the British Crown could not, because of the great expense that would, it would have involved, the British Crown could not have exercised much control um, in the colonies, um, and so government presence in people's lives was not very uh, uh, obvious. Um, certainly today in our lives we have government, if you will, everywhere. You only need to drive down the highway and you can see uh, police cars waiting to catch speeders. And, um, you know, we see government everywhere around us. Um, government back then was not a thick expression in people's lives. It was thin. Um, and that's largely because of the inability of the British Crown to project their empire deep into people's lives. So Tocqueville observes that people in the colonies were very much 
um, used to the idea of self-government at the local level and um, often had um, habits and practices of governing themselves that were established long before uh, the War of Independence came about. Um, so in that context then, it's perhaps easy to understand that when in 1763, in the 18th century, when British troops finally overcame the French in the Seven Years' War, and when that war subsequently left the British in debt, and the British Parliament began to pass tax laws, including the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765, that um, the tax laws might have sort of seemed a novel event in people's lives. All of a sudden they were being asked to contribute funds for uh, decisions taken, military actions taken that were not necessarily the will of the people. They seemed like wars of choice. They seemed not to be wars of necessity. Wars of necessity being wars that would have been necessary to preserve the lives of the people. These seem to be sort of um, uh, sort of um, uh, 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 projects uh, of the, the British um, Empire and um, this lack of relevance to people's lives I think left them scratching their heads you know why are we paying these taxes for wars that we have no real stake in um, so the taxes were not especially significant um, but the taxes were um, nevertheless uh, perceived to be in positions in the context of the way these people had been living in tremendous autonomy and self-governance. I, I hope not to idealize that, but I'm trying to set it up so that you understand that the response, according to many analysts anyway and historians who've looked at this, was more one of a cultural response than an economic response. You know, taxation without representation is the phrase that we all hear when we think about the Boston Tea Party, for example, pictured here in a lithograph, but I think um, the, the culture was a major factor, and I think historians do back that up. So the settlers responded by forming groups. Um, some of them were called the Sons of Liberty, and their job then, they took it on themselves to attack the stamp collectors and, and show them a piece of their mind, and uh, the, the Boston Tea Party in 1773 was a major expression of that desire and that expression. Um, of course, is the same expression that will subsequently uh, form uh, what's known as the spirit of 76. Now, a major figure in our reflections on the spirit of 76 must be Thomas Paine, um, who was an Englishman. He, in fact, only arrived in the Americas in 1774. Prior to then, he had been um, a, a thinker and uh, a writer of sorts. Um, he brought with him in his head um, a capacity not only to understand some of the radical democratic ideas that were being developed by philosophers at the time, but also an ability to express those in everyday commonsensical terms. So many people say that he is the sort of uh, intellectual father um, of the popular American Revolution. Um, the uh, book, the pamphlet that he wrote, Common Sense, uh, was at the time published anonymously, but it was signed off at the bottom by an Englishman. And while maybe only 100,000 copies were printed formally, about 500,000 copies circulated um, informally. And you have to think about that for a minute, because really, at the time, there were only 2 million free colonial citizens um, in, the, in the colonies uh, altogether. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it certainly speaks to the fact that a great number of people would have uh, read these uh, documents, would have read this, um, this, this pamphlet, and others like them, and um, would have been influenced by them. It's said that um, Payne's work was uh, discussed in bars and, uh, and family dinner tables, the length and breadth of the colonies. So clearly, um, he touched a nerve. So it's remarkable, as I was saying, 
For its style, he used the common man's language. He avoided formal intellectual style that many of the founding fathers were notorious for. Um, and today, of course, um, Paine is still well known. One of the central ideas he developed in the pamphlet was that, you know, in terms of hu sort of humanistic um, 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 philosophy, that the the republic that is a government where all the people are equally subject to the law is inherently peaceful because everyone gets a say about how so-called tax dollars are spent and where tax dollars are uh, spent in a way that the people have a say the people naturally aren't going to want to go to war um, and make war uh, when they don't have to it's just a waste of money right uh, otherwise, it's just vanity projects for for dictators and monarchs, right? So they can, uh, when when the dictators and the monarchs don't have to pay for the wars, uh, they can just sort of borrow money from the people, so to speak. Then there's no check on the ability of uh, the dictator to go to war. Once the people have a say and they can express their views on it, then naturally there is this check. And in fact, today we still sort of harbor this theory. Um, it's a central theory of classical uh, enlightenment liberalism and it's known today as the democratic peace theory um, subsequently developed by people like Immanuel Kant and other philosophers um, and leads directly to the establishment of the United Nations but that's a slight digression to get back to Thomas Paine's uh, impact on the American War of Independence one of the main ideas he was putting forward as a humanistic liberal was that the idea of monarchy itself is is a crime on humanity and um, when he appraised the nobility of King George's bloodline he described him famously as the principal ruffian of some restless gang and what he really meant by that I think was that uh, look I mean uh, democracy has to be by the people for the people all men um, all men and I think Paine actually was a radical in this regards uh, because not many people were advocating this viewpoint at the time. Paine said that all men should be allowed to vote and hold office. Um, this certainly would have not sat well with the people um, of his time, especially the elites of his time, um, who were, the majority of which were, were, were noblemen, and they would not have liked to imagine the people having power. And So I need you to keep that in mind as we go through this lecture, because obviously it's going to be important um, if the revolutionary leadership were all noblemen um, and they were the ones calling the shots then um, they're not going to like the idea that the common people are going to have a say in this as well right um, because it's going to influence their plans and uh, it's going to shape the direction that the country is going to evolve in once the revolution has taken place but Paine certainly believed that ordinary people were smart, that they were intelligent, that they could be rational if you gave them respect, if you gave them knowledge. Um, then who's to say that they don't have, um, uh, you know, the ability to, in their own minds, come up with truth, right? We'll come up, that, that the common sense of the people might be actually quite reliable. Um, the monarchy and the aristocracy in, in Paine's mind were the great frauds of history, you know. The, the, the justifications for the monarchy, the justifications for the anarchy, usually founded in the idea that the people are kind of brainless thugs and all too easily swayed by the passions of their emotions. Um, you know, these, this was the great fraud of history, going back as far as the Greeks. So, um, Plato, Aristotle, obviously had... Um, uh, as philosophers in ancient Greece had had set out views very much along those lines, and um, Paine was um, a, 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 you know eager to set the record straight. So he was a radical, um, a radical Democrat, um, and I think even his opponents, people like John Adams, who was typically considered to be conservative, even he would argue that um, without the influence of common sense. Um, you know, the, the, the campaign of General Washington would have been a disaster, you know. The people, in other words, had to get behind the purpose of the revolution or the revolution would be in vain. And um, it's said also that 
Washington himself, for this reason, had his soldiers read passages from uh, Common Sense to remind them why they were fighting. Um, interestingly, uh, Payne uh, talks about sunshine patriots and summertime soldiers. You know, this is the idea, of course, that um, a sort of as a sort of a call to arms that that what the colonial uh, revolutionaries needed to be thinking about was their passion and their commitment to the cause of the revolution. If you're uh, only going to have summertime soldiers, soldiers who aren't going to stick around through the winter months, you're not going to have much of a campaign. You're not going to have much of a revolution. So you need people that are going to sort of put aside their desire for comfort and pleasure, get out there, fight, um, even in the hard weather, even in the difficult times, in order to succeed. In order to succeed, um, and it's very obvious that you know even later on in the Vietnam War, these ideas still circulate. Uh, in fact, during the Vietnam War, soldiers like John Kerry, who came back from the war and threw away their medals, many people regard that as a kind of an anti-American moment. But think about the name that people like John Kerry attached to their mission in protesting against the war, protesting against the Vietnam War, they called themselves the Winter Soldiers. And that's a direct reference to pain and the spirit of pain. Um, who wants a summertime soldier? John Kerry and others saw themselves as, you know, the true patriots coming back from the war, having seen what they saw to be, in their minds anyway, a morally outrageous war against an innocent people in Vietnam. Um, the U.S. Uh, acting in their minds like an imperial power, uh, playing off against other superpowers in the uh, sort of a instrumentalizing way that uh, sort of disregards the immediate concerns of the people of Vietnam um, who were engaged in their own civil war that didn't have altogether that much to do with communism and democracy, the clash of communism and democratic capitalism, which was what the Cold War was about. It wasn't really something that the people of Vietnam related to very much. They wa they just wanted, in their minds, the independence. And John Kerry, having seen that, came back and said, it's time for the Winter Soldiers, right? So this is uh, how they're going to respond by invoking pain. Uh, so you see the pain has an influence in American politics um, from the time of the revolution even through to this day. Now, the spirit of 76, we need to think about um, some of the major ideas that shaped the thinking of the revolutionaries. And these are, of course, going to be ideas that get hotly debated in the following decades. Uh, so let's break them down into their constituent elements. We see, uh, first of all, liberty versus power. Then we see the question of legislatures versus executives. Uh, we see the question of the virtue of the American people. And we see the question of the small republic and the virtue, and whether the small republic is the best place to find a virtue in the people. Um, uh, pictured is, of course, Jefferson. And he is a leading figure here because, of course, he's going to be the guy that writes the Declaration of Independence. And he's going to be very influenced by people like Paine, not just Paine, but also John Locke, uh, the European philosopher popular at the time. So the question of liberty versus power, the, the, in this um, theme, the core battle is going to be against power um, seen as a kind of a vertically organized structure, uh, which by its very nature takes away from the autonomy of the people, takes away from the liberty of the people. Liberty as a sort of a basic principle um, assumes that all men are equal, uh, that they have rights to property, and that they have the right to have a say in their fate. And if you're going to be someone, a liberal, who believes in, in that liberty, then uh, you're going to be opposed to the monarchy. And I think it's important here to say, you know, like today, when we talk about conservatives versus liberals, we tend to do this term a disservice, because when we're talking about liberalism here, we're not really talking about it in the Glenn Beck sense. Glenn Beck and other conservative commentators today tend to sort of speak of liberalism as if it's a bad thing. 
right? But going back to the classical Enlightenment era, uh, people like John Locke and subsequently Jefferson are really sort of thinking about liberty in a different way. They're thinking about liberty not in this sort of pejorative sense that Glenn Beck attaches to it today, but rather in the sense of it being a very a sort of dynamic idea that's going to be the philosophical basis of a claim that takes power away from uh, the monarchy and gives it to uh, the people who really have the power at the end of the day. And reflecting that, uh, the idea here in relation to the question of legislatures versus executives is going to be that, um, that, that when you have one person in charge making the legislation, making the laws that is, um, and executing the laws, um, whether it's a king or a dictator or a tyrant of some sort, then, you know, you see very clearly that, as the phrase goes, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And um, when the revolutionaries looked at their situation, they saw that they were not being given a say, and the English, British were engaging in these wars of choice and then making the people pay for them. So if the people had had a say, if they had their own legislature, if they could make their own laws, then they would have a voice and they would know that this voice would be uh, able to, um, uh, you know, have a say in whether wars were declared and things like this, so they could keep the power of the executive in check. Um, this is very important because it means that um, the, 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 the prosperity of the people is going to flow back to them and not be lost. Um, they'll be able to improve their condition, um, give themselves more comfort, give themselves a more elegant and refined and um, comfortable existence. Now, the question of virtue is important here as well because, of course, how do we know the people are going to be good masters of their own laws. Well, um, obviously there's the reality, you know, w w when we think about um, the people governing themselves um, without any sort of supervisor, um, we uh, often think of that as being something that is desired by anarchists today. Um, so um, anarchists having a bad name uh, by many people who believe that, look, it, that they're kind of idealists, that the people governing themselves are going to be kind of um, serving themselves and and um, lining their own pockets, you know, uh, uh, slipping into sort of moral disrepair. Um, so what was it going to take then um, to be able to govern yourself in freedom but also in discipline, you know, self-discipline? Um, and this, of course, was... Uh, and uh, the answer to this question by those who were the revolutionaries were, was that there was something special about the American people. Uh, they'd come all this way from Europe. They were adamant frontiersmen. They were uh, hard people. They knew the value of hard work. They knew the importance of order. And so uh, because of their special character, because of their culture, they were going to be the kinds of people you could trust to make their own laws. Um, not in favor of themselves, not to serve themselves uh, like some kind of, as I say in economics, zero-sum game, but rather a win-win scenario where um, everyone was going to obey the laws and, um, and, and do so not just in their own self-interest but in the interests of what we call the common good. Um, so, so we have a lot of elements here then. We have the spirit of liberty being expressed as an antithesis or an antidote, rather, for power. Uh, we have a hope for the legislation of the people versus the idea of the executive. And we also have a specific concept of the cultural virtue of the American people. Another key element here is the idea of the small republic. Um, the revolutionaries did not care for the idea of a very big country. Uh, they didn't want um, a United States of America. They wanted a collection of states in America. They were, in fact, hoping for a 
group which they were going to call these United States, not the United States. So, um, and, and why would that be? Well, when they looked at, at the British Empire and they saw the, the wars of choice that the British Empire was engaging in, they realized the British Empire was meeting the same fate that every empire seems to meet historically that they fall into decadence and corruption, that they become cruel, and that they tax their people, and um, and that the elites, uh, you know, become detached in terms of uh, being in touch with, with the, the masses. So um, the Founding Fathers were inspired in this instance by sort of going back to the founding of democracy. They wanted to go back to the small republics of ancient Greece, where, in their view, democracy was actually born. So that's a crucial distinction, right? To to sort of uh, see a large country, to see um, large political realms as somehow imperial in nature, and to go back to sort of the idea of small, modest republics and communities like they had in ancient Greece, where democracy was founded. Um, this was a central value. So, so, so these are the. Uh, ideas that are going to inspire, you know, subsequently the Declaration of Independence, the constitutions of the new states once they're formed, and indeed the Articles of Confederation, which create the first um, uh, constitution of the United States. So when it came to pass in 75 that the Continental Congress was convened, they asked Thomas Jefferson, who was a popular Democrat, to write the Declaration of Independence. And Jefferson, as I've mentioned, was inspired by Locke, who believed that people could govern themselves in, as I've said, this positive sum game, this win-win scenario where um, uh, it's not going to be anarchy. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, up to that point in time, this was not a way that people were familiar with thinking. You know, it usually was thought that if the people were going to, going to govern themselves, as I've said, um, that it would be kind of dog-eat-dog, -dog, law of the jungle, right? Um, the idea that people could govern themselves in a way that everyone benefited from um, without fear, without coercion, uh, was, was really quite kind of idealistic. And many people said very naive. So. Uh, Locke had proposed uh, that the people should strike a social contract and uh, master their own fate. And, and even if government fails to do its job, they'd have the right to raise up in a revolution against that government. So you can see how, how these ideas sort of prefigure um, what eventually becomes the, the United States War of Independence. So what did this mean for how people envisioned um, the early character of the United States politically? Um, well, from the uh, idealism of Jefferson's uh, Declaration of Independence, the next step is the Articles of Confederation, which is the first basic constitution of the realm. And we see clearly that those ideas really do translate um, into the Articles of Confederation. The, um, the legislature is going to have um, the primacy of power over the executive, and the constituent states of the Union are going to have a lot of power, and uh, they're going to have most of the powers, in fact, and that the federal government, such as it is, is going to have very little. In fact, it was even the case that the federal government would have to go basically asking for for funding from the states, um, and it was going to be up to the states at their discretion to, to give that money to uh, the federal government. So uh, really at this juncture, I think we can see that, that the power is flowing bottom up, and the, the states, the people, have a lot of autonomy um, relative to, to, to the federal government. So in this slide, um, we are talking about the time frame from the revolution to the constitution, the forming of the constitution itself. Um, now, the economic situation of the 1780s was not great. Um, the uh, early uh, days, the early decade of independence um, left the country um, with a lot of debt for um, the funding of the war. And um, and so ideas start to emerge um, fast 
actually uh, once people have the experience of living under the Articles Confederation um, as I've mentioned the country had a lot of debts and and what did th this was significant because it meant that um, money from the states was flowing to, p to pay the debts and um, one of the casualties of this uh, this phenomena uh, was that the veteran farmers who had fought in the in the war, uh, the majority of the soldiers who had fought had their own farmsteads, of course, and once they got back to their farms, they found that they were not receiving pay for their services. But of course, they had debts that they needed to pay to their landlords for their land and for their um, crops and and for their um, provisions so uh, how are they going to pay those debts if they had not been making any money while they were in the campaign and once they got back they were not receiving their government pay for being a soldier um, so obviously these guys are going to be upset and they started to feel agitated and many went to the state legislatures to seek redress however um, the state legislatures were generally run by people from the merchant class, indeed many of which were lenders who in fact would have stand, stood, stood to lose by um, uh, the soldiers being paid because of course there was no money to pay them so how, how would the legislatures have proposed to pay them except to print money, right, to print paper notes, to cash money. Um, now cash money is an interesting phenomena because the more of it that there is in the economy um, relative to the relatively finite amount of goods in the economy the value of uh, cash in the economy is going to to, to decrease um, this is going to affect the value of the debt holdings of the people who lent the money in the first place so so if these are the guys that are in the legislature you can understand that they wouldn't want the amount of money that they're owed back to deflate right um, relative to the to the to the fact that goods and services stay at a relatively stagnant price um, so you have yourself an impasse and in this impasse something's got to give um, we see this push come to shove in Massachusetts in 1786 when a former officer by the name of Daniel Shays leads a band of farmers on the state armory I don't think Shays was a real sort of revolutionary in the sense of wanting to take over the state or anything like that he was trying to make a political point it's very very clear however uh, Madison, uh, James Madison, and other elite Democrats like him were absolutely horrified by uh, this development. And their reaction, their response, was to really criticize Shays um, for his actions. And they took this really as a sign that the masses were really not ready to be governed for, for self-government at all that they were immature and that they needed to exert the power of the state to to educate and to lead um, where the masses clearly were not demonstrating leadership um, themselves so if there was going to be peace and prosperity in the land order would have to be preserved and that was madison's response indeed abigail adams a conservative commentator at the time called the Shays revolutionaries ignorant restless desperados and I quote without conscience or principles have led a deluded multitude she says to follow their standard under pretense of grievances which have no existence but in their imaginations instead of that laudable spirit which you approve which makes a people watchful over their liberties and alert in the defense of them these mobbish insurgents are for sapping the foundation and destroying the whole fabric at once long quote sorry about that but that's Abigail Adams in a letter to Thomas Jefferson who was at the time the American ambassador in Paris but Jefferson, as we've already discussed, was a popular Democrat, not an elite Democrat. Uh, Adams and Madison were on the conservative side. But look at Jefferson's response here. 
um, in his letter to to Abigail Adams, um, and this is a very famous quote in American political life. Um, Jefferson argues that the Shays rebels, in fact, were behaving themselves very honorably. Um, and the last thing you want in any country is to have a bunch of complacent citizens. You can't have a democracy if citizens are going to be just asleep at the wheel. So he says, and what country can preserve its liberties if the rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The tree of liberty, he says, must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Clearly, then, you see the battle lines are drawn intellectually there, right? You know, on the one hand, Abigail Adams saying the people who led the revolt for the wages for the farmers um, and veterans uh, were uh, ignorant, restless desperados without conscience or principle. And then you have Jefferson saying, these guys are great, you know, um, they may not be very well educated, they may not be able to express uh, fully what they're saying, and their choice of means might be dubious. I mean, maybe this could have been resolved without taking up arms, says Jefferson. But on the other hand, you have to give them their due. They're awake. They're participating in their political life. Um, they're not asleep. They know what's going on. Um, and they are not stupid, right? They have a view. They're upset. And you have to take them seriously for that, if nothing else. So we'll stop here, folks. Um, we'll call this the end of part one. And um, I'll upload this video. And we'll have part two uploaded um, and ready for you as soon as you uh, finish watching this part one. Okay? Thanks very much.